first, uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting this in invitation to talk with you. I really appreciate that. And uh, uh, Sudanese people are very excited now with this interview and they like very eager to look at the result and what will happen mm -hmm. to, during this conversation between us. So um, um, I'm going to ask a, a few questions about science in Sudan and uh, also the energy in Sudan. And because you were the Secretary of Energy you know, in the United States, yeah, you definitely have a great experience. Uh, plus, you are a Nobel laureate <laughs> in physics, so your opinion uh, definitely matters for us. So uh, the first thing I would like to know uh, what the uh, USA opinion about investing in science in Sudan. Like, we haven't seen any investment from the United States in Sudan so far. Well, I can't say specifically what the U.S. opinion is investing in Sudan, but I do support very much mm -hmm. U.S. investment in science, especially in developing countries, mm -hmm. to really help them get a start. I think um, investing in science, investing in, in the most important commodity of any country, which is the people, right. will help uh, those countries mm -hmm. uh, rise more quickly out of poverty, become uh, developed countries, and that is very good for yes. everything in the world. So, so um, what do you think of um, uh, how, what kind of form USA will invest in scientific, in science research in Sudan? What do you, what do you expect from USA to do? Okay, that's a good question. I think it can take several forms. Mm -hmm. One is uh, you get scientific conferences and people mm -hmm. in the United States, in Europe, the United States is not the only country, yes. to, to go and visit Sudan, yes. find out what it's like. Mm -hmm. Also, workshops to uh, help uh, talk to the people there, the the native scientists and the school teachers and the science teachers, and to try to give them inspiration and and to essentially encourage them to to actually say you're doing something very important. Right. Also, finally, to talk to government leaders to the extent that they realize that education and science education, but education in general and literacy in general yeah. is one of the most important things a government can do for a country. Right. So, but, but there is, uh, as you know, there is sanction on Sudan and uh, there is no way to invest in anything in Sudan. Maybe recently we have the medical equipment, is, the sanctions lifted from medical equipment, and we do expect that other sanctions should be ex lifted from Sudan soon, maybe in the near future. Uh, until that time, there is no way you can go and say, okay, I want to invest in Sudan. That's so true, but, but there's a difference between, uh, well, if there's government investment, there's private sector investment, then, then there's workshops, scientific education workshops, right. which I think uh, the U.S. government uh, doesn't control. I mean, in mm -hmm. the United States, we, we do these things and we cooperate with other countries on a scientist-to-scientist, field-to-field level, and so I think I'm not really sure, but I, I don't really recall having uh, been in an experience where the U.S. government says com comes in and says, no, you can't go to country X because because uh, we disapprove of what they're doing. Maybe because you never <laughs> start thinking, try to, to do about Sudan or talk to Oh, Sudan to, to, to uh, Sudan. I don't know about Sudan in particular, but I know I remember very early in my career mm -hmm. when I was a postdoc, yeah. I was supposed to give uh, an invited talk at a an international conference, you probably heard of it, it's the uh, uh, ICAT, the International okay. Conference yeah. on the Top right. of Physics. Yes. I was a postdoc, it was going to be my first invited talk at an international uh, conference, uh, a very high profile one, mm -hmm. to be held in Riga, in Russia, and yeah. Russia invaded Afghanistan, <laughs> and there was a great deal of concern. Right. The government never said, we forbid you to go. I think many of us said, well, we're on our sure. own, but they never waited. <laughs> and right. uh, had they waited, in, it would have been more incentive to go. <laughs> so so um, you think USA will be open to go to invest in science in Sudan? Well, I, I would hope so. I don't know the particulars of what mm -hmm. is behind the sanctions in Sudan at the current moment. Uh, and these must be, mm -hmm. in, couldn't be just US sanctions, right. they, they must be international sanctions. And so that, you know, this is always a very ticklish situation, as right. you know, because sanctions mm -hmm. affect innocent people. It does. <laughs> I can tell it affects me myself. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so um, 
So you mentioned actually that's actually a question I had already. You mentioned something about the uh, private sector uh, yes. investing. So, for, as a scientist from Sudan, I think one of the solution for uh, my country is that uh, we have the the industry engaged with the research somehow, in a way that the industry fund the research because the government doesn't fund the research; they don't care that much, and the people are poor. They, they don't have enough money to do mm -hmm. any any um, investment in their own uh, education. Yes. So. Um, what do you think about what, how? What's your message actually to the private sector in USA about engaging with the scientific research that targeting, localizing that place in Sudan? Well, it's it's that's a decision for the companies, but I think many companies in, in around the world, including the United States, look at developing countries. There are uh, there are reasons why, and you know, totally understandable reasons why mm -hmm. a particular country wants that private investment, not to right. just open up a market, mm -hmm. to then say, we'll import goods and we get to open up the market and sell, but many countries, most countries in fact, want mm -hmm. uh, companies uh, that come into their country to set up manufacturing in the country, to actually begin to build locally an exactly. infrastructure. Exactly. And and it, again, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on whether the companies feel at ease. Mm -hmm. uh, could the workforce be trained? Right. Not trained just trainable uh, mm -hmm. because they face that in the United States. Sometimes the workforces in the United States are, may not be trained for what they want, but they are certainly willing to go in and do that. And so those are many, many issues and it's up to the government in the Sudan of uh, people of Sudan and the enterprises in Sudan to say, yes, we have a, mm -hmm. uh, a workforce that can be trained, that can actually help be productive and that your investment here would be uh, economically worthwhile. Right. So, so um, um, you think? Uh, well, so, as you said, Sudan has to do some, some something more regarding that uh, problem. But uh, what I wanted to hear, like a message from you to big business, uh, bis business in USA, like big companies in USA, why you should try think about Sudan or support well, science. Well, um, my <laughs> message to any any big business or small business, moderate sized business. Uh, the mom and pop stores are really not interested in international <laughs> <laughs> markets, but um, medium and large size businesses can be. Uh, I would encourage all of them to look at emerging markets. Right. Uh, it's anticipated that Africa will be a great emerging market. You know, first China, followed right. by South Asia, followed by Africa, and, exactly. and so you you sh they should be for their own right. uh, prosperity and economic prosperity of their company. Be right. looking. Actually, you mentioned something about the market. I think I think Sudan, if you look at the location of Sudan in the map, the geographical location, it's exactly sitting in the heart of Africa, and that means it's a it's a brilliant location to be honest. I think connecting the whole country, or the whole the continent, mm -hmm. especially the center of Africa with Europe and East right. uh, East part. Maybe it's a little bit difficult to use it, but I still I think it's okay f with connection with Europe. And uh, I from my Personal or my own point of view, I think this is one of the best market for USA to settle there and to launch from there to Africa and to Europe as well. So um, uh, maybe this will lead us to the next point of the industrial uh, energy. But before we go to energy, I would like to ask you a question because you called atom, <laughs> and I also do call atoms. I st I'm still learning. Um, um, I I have a dream to build a cold atom center in Sudan. That will be the first cold atom in mm -hmm. Africa. If you, if you, you know, so what do you think? What do you think about this idea? I know, I know how much it costs. Okay, <laughs> I know how much it costs. I know how to build it, but um, I, I don't have money myself to invest in that. Well, it depends on what you want to do with cold atoms. As you know mm -hmm. uh, from your experiences here at Stanford, that mm -hmm. uh, you can use inexpensive diode lasers yeah. cells to do that. It's very inexpensive. Right. Um, they. The cold atom technologies have reached into undergraduate physics laboratories, that's right, that's right. and it is a wonderful way to teach people mm -hmm. about physics, about atoms, mm -hmm. and to inspire them. Right. Uh, so that is a kind of a low entree cost. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you want to look at what is currently viewed as some of the frontiers of cold atom research, as you know, there are very large groups right. <laughs> with tens of people per that's group, right. uh, multi-million dollar budgets. Right. But that's okay. You don't want to compete with these very large established groups. I right. never wanted to compete with those right. large 
to salvage groups. That's why I moved out. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as the the big boys move in, I find I ha I should go and do something else, starting from new, mm -hmm. where everything when you start new is very inexpensive. So so there's the educational experience part, and that yes. doesn't cost yes. much. That doesn't cost much money, yes. and that is could be very important. This is really exciting. Not only mm -hmm. to see with very expensive diode lasers, you can see these atoms being trapped, okay. but you can also trap using fairly inexpensive lasers, you know, cells and, and even molecules in an optical microscope, which they can see with their own eyes. Well, well right, but my, my, my point is that, um, first, it's not about we African want to compete with those big groups. No, it's, a, it's exactly what you, what you said, it's an experience and skill we right. build when we work with cold atoms. So the amount of skills I build and I have in my pocket will allow me to go and build entirely different industry outside, exactly as you switch from right. cold to, to a... Well, I mean, the laser right. technology you're, you're learning with Leo Holberg That's are right. going to be invaluable for any any laser, electro-optic, right. whatever uh, so applications in, in science, technology, industry. Right. So, so, in my opinion, that's one of the methods that we can use yeah. to, you know, initiate the industry in, in, in Sudan. And so if, if let's say, um, if one of the institutes here decide, okay, I'm going to adopt this idea and I'm going to help you guys build a coal atom center in Sudan, uh, then he somehow contribute to the market, building the market for USA or mm -hmm. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear like, will we find some kind of answer for what, can we, can we find a fund for, for this type of center? Well, you should, I think you and I and Leo can talk about this, uh, bef uh, you know, before your postdoc is over. Yeah. There are a number of people within Silicon Valley who could get excited about bringing new technologies through first through science education right. and the technology through science education the first thing you want to do is you want to excite young people right. uh, the second thing you want to do is you want to excite them and then have that lead to meaningful jobs mm -hmm. where you might not get rich I mean if you go into science to get rich you uh, made a bad choice <laughs> but, <laughs> <I've seen anyone laughs> <now. laughs> but uh, if you go into science because you love science yeah. because it is a noble profession and because ultimately it can really improve society uh, that's a very good reason yeah. and and many people feel that uh, investing in science and especially science education yeah. is a worthwhile investment not only in the United States but all around the world so, so it's exactly as the last point you said that it's helping the people. So, um, just one, I want to maybe make a correction a little bit about competing with a peer group. Um, when I say called Atom Center, I don't mean only just um, like what we do now, atomic clocks or PEC or, mm -hmm. or, or MI uh, mode. Um, you can think of uh, ion traps as well. Yes. And uh, I work a lot with ion traps at, in UC Berkeley before I come here. And um, I can assure you that I have ideas that uh, might compete very well with big groups. So I have a recent result now in Nature, it's still, it's still under consideration. But I'm looking for a time where I can build the, I continue my research because I cracked something while working there. And um, I think that will make me be able to compete with big groups as well. Well, you can always compete with a big group if you have a really new idea. Right. And and I don't want to discourage you from competing with big right. groups, but exactly. but if you think of, if you look at the complexity mm -hmm. of, of the experiments now being done with some of the groups, even the groups here, Mark Kesevich, not even, well, they, these are pretty big groups, mm -hmm. <laughs> Mark Kesevich's group, um, um, Monica's group, right. Yeah, right, that yeah. you look at their tables, you look at, this is a lot of high technology. That's right. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you... One, I've always tried to stay away from, uh, even though I did that for several decades, mm -hmm. you find yourself, as you pursue the next step, going to much more sophisticated technology, much better control, lasers, right. all these other things. That's right. And it gets, uh, and then you realize, really a new idea with a slightly new direction <laughs> is much <laughs> more enjoyable. Right. So, okay, I will now just ask you a few questions for people ask. I have uh, mm -hmm. a question from a doctor. His name is Dr. Hisham Hassan. Uh, he's a molecular genetics in Bahrain. And I have a question from Dr. Mema. She's in the Canadian Council mm -hmm. for Engineering. 
and they're asking about uh, this is Sudan said this like agree uh, eager to collaborate with USA but Sanchin is a big uh, I think we can answer this question they yeah. ask what's your what do you think how we can collaborate with you in, in again uh, yes I, I I did answer that uh, um, I don't know the details of the sanction right. quite candidly but but you know and sanctions forbid companies or and possibly individuals from doing certain things, but uh, it depends on what the sanctions are. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most Americans couldn't travel to Cuba for a better part of a half a century, or longer. Because <laughs> they didn't want to. <laughs> no, I think uh, there were, there were real, uh, there were real uh, government uh, rules that for actually forbid travel. Yeah. Uh, now that is uh, going, you know, softened a great deal, and tourism is now all right, uh, mm -hmm. which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I can't speak to the details of the sanctions, uh, okay. and because countries are different, they're, different. you know, and different sanctions for different countries. Yeah. And then, and also some students ask about the scholarship, because um, we haven't seen any scholarship from USA to Sudan. And maybe there are some of them recently start to happen, to appear. Uh, haven't seen from Stanford, let's say. Uh, haven't seen. Uh, I saw one from UC Berkeley, but in different field, not in physics. So, uh, what do you what's, what do you think? In yeah, I, you know, it usually scholarships like that are started by philanthropists <coughs> who have a connection with uh, another country. Either it was their country of origin, their home country, <coughs> or they see a particular benefit from <coughs> from actually helping. American students or Stanford students in particular uh, to get relationships with uh, foreign countries or universities within foreign countries or things of that nature. Right. And so those things are usually funded, they start by funding from some person who, who has a lot of money right. who does want to invest in that thing. And so that means one has to really go around and be somewhat entrepreneurial to try to identify people who right. see that there could be some benefit, and in this case, uh, for science education and science development in Africa and in particular Sudan. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think myself. Um, if we somehow manage to bring the industry to be in connection with the research in Sudan, somehow, like in solar, as we're going to yeah. talk soon. That that depends. It depends on on what the company wants. If it's sometimes companies uh, have the nose to the wheel, they just want. Scientists or engineers to right. just improve the product just over a very short horizon, six months, a year, two years. Yeah. Uh, less interested in science education at the high school, college level, mm -hmm. where the you know the harvesting of those investments won't occur for <laughs> five or ten years, <laughs> <laughs> and and so it really depends on the companies and what, but but. Even on the short term, companies could be yeah. a big pull because right. they are the people who would normally hire the scientists and engineers. Right. And universities are very limited in their ability to hire professors, right? Yeah. It's a very small number of people who uh, right. become professors in any country. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think uh, these are almost, almost the same qu the, the questions I want to ask about science. So I now change, switch to energy in Sudan, and uh, the first thing I want to ask, <coughs> or I want to talk with you about, uh, is the solar energy. I know you have a passion for clean energy, and I am a big fan of your opinions in that, that direction, and I agree with you about nuclear energy as well. But let's first start with solar solar mm -hmm. energy in Sudan. Um, uh, I think you already looked in the map and looked you find Sudan that has the longest day life in in the, in yes. the world maybe, and has very large areas. So what's the uh, What's your opinion about the solar, solar future, solar energy, the future of in Sudan? Uh, I think it's very bright. I think um, if you think now about mm -hmm. energy in particular, right. uh, if there are regions in Sudan or in any part of Africa or Asia mm -hmm. where you have to truck in diesel fuel mm -hmm. to generate electricity, mm -hmm. it already is by far less expensive to install solar and modest batteries. Right. The first applications of electricity are usually what for cell phones, mm -hmm. for pumping water, mm -hmm. for purifying water, uh, for small refrigerators to keep medicines cold, mm -hmm. or or to run fans, things right. like that. Right. 
Uh, many of those things have their own batteries. Pumping water, the essential battery is when the sun is shining, you pump water and you put it up in a little <laughs> stand and, right. and it's done. So it, it's stored energy. Yeah. Um, now, you, you only get that maybe a third to a quarter of the time, the solar energy. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, and there could be times when you need electricity, not when the sun is shining. So you do need some modest storage. But the other thing is if there are times when you have bad weather for a week or two, mm -hmm. then you use diesel or bunker fuel. Right. But only as emergency backup. Yeah. Because the operating expense of, of running a generator is not the cost of the generator, it's the fuel. Right. So, so it's already a very good deal. Now going forward, you can see solar, depending on where Sudan gets its electricity generation from, uh, you know, we, we, use, we get from the dam, like water. Yes, uh, hydro is fantastic. Yeah. And yeah. if you have dams near solar capability, what people are doing more and more is they have a little holding pond just below the dam. Right. Uh, you need five or 600 meters height. Right. And you use the solar energy to pump water up the hill. Right. And then you can let back down into the pond. Um, you know. It's not enough yet. It's not. I mean, still the country you can find uh, huge parts of the countries are still in dark. They yes. don't have uh, yes. electricity. But but they don't have yes because the grid doesn't reach there. Right. And so they're isolated. So that's why I'm saying that solar power with a very very you know these are micro micro grids right. or nano grids. <laughs> right. Let's call it a nano grid in your house, your hut, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But a micro grid is just shared facility of a village. Right. You can have electricity for those essential things that I talked about mm -hmm. uh, at very low cost because the in the last four years the cost of solar mm -hmm. has dropped about fourfold. I see. It's it's tremendous and most people aren't really aware of how much cheaper it got only in the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. So that's a big deal. Uh, there always are people who want to say no 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 it's not reliable you need diesel fuel because these are mostly promulgated by people who sell diesel fuel. Which, yeah, <laughs> but it can be backup, as you said. Still. It, it should be backup. Back yeah. Right. So, so, and Sudan is, is a huge land of agriculture, like very good agricultural land. So um, I'm thinking of like having villages, you know, you have, we have the longest river in the world crossing the country in Tha. And there are areas where you can have um, entire area region is a kind of desert, but it's still the Nile, you know, mm -hmm. going through, through it. So that's a very, very good place for to have a very large solar field. For yes, energy. if if you have, you know, there's a there's a project that is being built in Chile, mm -hmm. which uh, this is northern Chile, right near the equator, mm -hmm. high altitudes, six hundred meters, mm -hmm. uh, very clear skies. So right. it too has some of the very best uh, solar capability in the world and what they're doing is and this was actually American capital mm -hmm. that invested in it to build solar arrays yeah. 600 megawatts so this is a large-scale solar array yeah. uh, plus pump hydro so they will pump seawater up mm -hmm. this cliff 630 meters into this little holding pond mm -hmm. and at and if, when you need electricity when the sun isn't shining you just let back down a lot of the electricity goes to Santiago, which is south, which is where their major city areas are, right. in the capital. Yeah. So that means you have to build a smaller transmission line. In cases where uh, you are isolated, there is no grid, then it's perfect, because you have that micro grid. Okay. It doesn't have to be hundreds of megawatts, you know, tens of megawatts, or a megawatt would be just mm -hmm. fine. Just pumping water up and down the hill. So, so if I ask you to, like, uh, give a message to, to investors in USA here in Silicon Valley or anywhere and the government itself about that market what will you tell them well I, I would tell them what uh, <laughs> um, uh, this is less to do with the US government and more to do with private investment okay. that particular project was due to it started with a bunch of Stanford students who noticed that Chile had great solar capability right. and they had this high cliff mm -hmm. and that got the interest of private investors now what the private investors needed to do is they needed to be sure if we build this that there would be an agreement, a contract, saying someone would pay for the electricity at a certain price. And then you bargain with the price. So it's a contract. 
you can't get private investors to say, well, if we build it uh, and there's no one that assures with reasonable probability that uh, the bills will be paid, right. they would be scared to do it. Right? And in many cases, in, in many countries, including developing countries, uh, the government, for example, Mexico would step in, and I think Argentina did the same, and said, you know, if the utility company doesn't pay the bill, we'll backstop it. I see. So okay. the government helps. The government helps in the sense that, you know, usually governments may be more reliable than a utility company in a <laughs> developing country. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> usually. And, and, uh, and so that gives, that helps investor confidence. All right, I see. So um, you mentioned that Stanford students actually they, they draw the attention to that place. Do you, do you expect this exper experimental experience can happen exact same in Sudan? I, I think I think so. I think you know the Stanford students uh, are very inventive. Uh, mm -hmm. They're they don't they're you know they they're willing to think outside of boundaries and boxes. Right. And uh, we have a growing international group of students, both undergraduate and graduate students. Right. And uh, the idea of thinking of creative ways where where you can get foreign capital. Foreign capital is American capital, European capital, Chinese capital, you name it. Right. There's lots of people who have lots of capital looking for a good home. Mm -hmm. And uh, they want to make a good investment. They don't want to invest in something that ultimately can do a lot of good, but in the end, if it goes bankrupt, it mm -hmm. does no one any good. Right. Right? It even gives clean energy or things like that a bad name if you put in an investment and it doesn't lead to uh, <coughs> I mean, <coughs> financial viability. It's a, it's a, um, I mean, you can you just don't go blind, go blindly into a project unless, until, unless you do evaluation for that, like scientific, as exact as as the Stanford student, student did. So, um, we don't have anybody from, Sta I mean, I'm here, <laughs> not anybody from Stanford in Sudan who can do that. No one from Stanford going to Sudan. This is just an example taking Stanford. And you can apply it to any any big university or anybody interested. So how how can I expect the yeah, yeah so how yeah you, you don't necessarily have to have strong connections with people who mm. are living or natives of Sudan. Yeah. Uh, many times uh, now in this international world, you see many investors from foreign countries going in and looking yeah. at whether there's going to be right. you know an opportunity with. Again, with the assurance that um, that contracts will be honored. Okay, <laughs> so that that's a very important part. So I will consider this invitation to <laughs> to people from here to go to Sudan. <laughs> <laughs> while you can, you, while you're here, you can start talking. You you we must have friends uh, here in Stanford in, yeah, that are, right. but are but also who are interested in developing right. Africa and Sudan in particular. I'm I'm thinking to create something actually. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, I have um, um, another question. That, um, uh, first, before we close up the solar energy, do you expect there will be a scientific research uh, in that, uh, around that um, area? Oh, oh uh, there is. Because there continues to be scientific research. There are problems, as you know. Uh, are we talking about solar energy in Africa or solar energy in general? Or solar energy in Africa. Okay. I think some of the problems that I know of solar energy in Africa are, t there, there are several. Uh, dust. Yes. Dust. This Sand. Dust. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there, that's an active area of study. Now, how do you keep the solar panels clean without using a lot of water? Because water is very precious. That's right. In many places where there's really good sun. That's right. And so there are researchers around the world, uh, the uh, Department of Energy, sponsoring some of this, okay. to actually have nano coatings of things like that so that uh, they can be almost self-cleaning or clean with a minimal amount of water. Okay. And they're used, and some of the more inventive ways are to mimic the way nature does this. Mm -hmm. That, you know, even though you could be in a very arid climate, there quite often is a pre-dawn, a little bit of moisture. Mm -hmm. And could you use that moisture, that natural moisture that condenses and, and, and has these little uh -huh. micro droplets rolling down and cleaning it? Oh, okay. Or very, very modest amounts of uh, mechanical force with minimal amount of water. Yeah. That's a big deal. 
The other is the storage. Um, the reason I like pump storage is because it's a known technology and it's the cheapest way of storing lots of power right. and energy. Right. Batteries are an issue because the current sealed batteries that we have, like lithium ion batteries, don't do well at very hot temperatures. <laughs> That's right. And they have to be cooled. If you go to uh, 40 degrees centigrade yeah. in a baking sun, they're going to disintegrate. That's exactly what's happening. Yes, exactly. And so, again, this will depend on a number of things. I know of several companies and, and professors yeah. trying to work on batteries that would work without needing a controlled environment, like air conditioning. <coughs> Once it gets over 80 or 90 degrees centigrade, most batteries right. need to be air conditioned. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work in, yeah, in Africa. Can, that doesn't work in South Asia. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to have air conditioning. Right, uh, the, and even the automobile batteries today in today's cars like the Tesla, if you park them in an outside garage right. in the sun, let's say in Arizona where it can get very hot, they actually use some of the battery to cool the battery to run a little refrigeration just so it stays below this temp temperature. Now, if you leave that car for two weeks, guess what? You come back to a very dead battery. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, it, and, it, and, and so... so the push for high temperature batteries is also there in developed countries like the United States, but it's much more important in developing countries that are in warm climates. So, so that's a very, I think that will be very good research in, to yes. offer in Sudan for the high temperature batteries. High temperature batteries, yeah. refrigerators that work more efficiently, right. because the efficiency of a refrigerator depends on not only the temperature you want to keep your food at, mm -hmm. but the outside ambient temperature. And as you go to higher and higher temperatures, you actually need different cooling fluids than the ones designed for America or Northern Europe. And uh, there is, again, these, these are two things that I happen to know we were pushing when I was Secretary of Energy. Okay, actually, uh, I didn't know that the batteries themselves need to be cool. <laughs> yes, now <laughs> so you that's know. That's a big problem, yeah. <laughs> and the refrigerators, the, 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 cooling, uh, element, the cooling material fluids of refrigerators uh, that were optimized to the United States or Europe that don't work well in the higher the higher temperatures. And so that again, this is a big market because as the world gets wealthier, guess what? Mm -hmm. They can afford air conditioning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's still clean energy, right? We we're looking for clean energy somehow. Yeah, you still yeah, need clean energy, energy to run the air conditioning. All right, so um, I will now move to the second question about the nuclear energy in Sudan. And um, the reason why I'm asking this um, asking this question or as I need to know about your opinion about nuclear energy. Because um, as I mentioned that Sudan could be like the new market and I think that the world is now looking is desperate for a new market, especially as a, if you want to sell your product somehow, you want to send your qualified people to have your mm -hmm. factories, same as you did in, in China and, and you know, like revolution in that region in Asia. You want to start happening in Africa as well. So a new market when I say new market, means like factories, entire industry uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And in order to, to have, to accommodate that place in a short time, you definitely need a like clean and stable source of energy, which is only available by nuclear energy, nuclear power plant, I think. So uh, what do you think about uh, nuclear energy in that area in Sudan? Well, the, uh, I agree with you that uh, if you start to have energy intensive industries, yeah. you need uh, energy sources that would be energy on demand. Now, that doesn't mean you don't develop solar or wind, but mm -hmm. but when there's no wind or no solar, you can't have your factory sitting there. Just your backup. Is okay. Yeah, it's so it's your backup. Yeah. And uh, nuclear power is a form of clean energy, right. uh, and I've been pretty consistent mm -hmm. uh, before I was secretary, during the time I was secretary, and afterwards, okay. That one could should really consider nuclear power right. as a clean source of energy. Yeah. Um, there's the economics. There's several issues. There's the economics. There's the safety, and nonproliferation things like tourism. All those are real problems. Yeah. The safety problem, I think, is a very curable problem, <laughs> meaning that the new generation of reactors now being installed in China, the United States, elsewhere are considerably safer than the Fukushima-style reactors, right. the first generation of the modern reactors. 
But even those reactors, uh, every time there's an accident, we learn from them. And they, those reactors mm -hmm. are made more safe. Uh, we are trying to work on a reactor which is what we call walk-away safe. That means you lose control of the power, you lose control of your water supply, you lose control of everything, and you just walk away from it and you're, there's an earthquake, some catastrophe that completely isolates mm -hmm. the reactor. Can it ever melt down as in a contamination issue? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we were pushing and trying to support the engineering of is these walkway safe reactors. They're passively safe. Uh, the small modular reactors can do that. The very large reactors, now the new designs are being designed to be three days safe. You need to be about seven days safe. Mm -hmm. Once it's seven days safe, that means there's uh, not enough residual heat to actually cause a meltdown mm -hmm. and okay. <coughs> contamination. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is we have to figure out how to build nuclear power reactors on budget on schedule. If you don't, if there's a few years delay, yeah. then uh, it digs a financial hole. Yeah. Because people are very concerned about contamination issues, uh, there's much more inspection internationally on a nuclear reactor. So, mm -hmm. so that uh, is important in order to have reliable grid construction. Mm -hmm. For countries that don't have the inherent embedded technology basis, it's very important those countries actually train a regulatory force mm -hmm. and a workforce that operates through actors that are well trained. It's just like um, right. yeah. uh, countries uh, don't have to develop their own jet planes, mm -hmm. but when they, they have, they, they yeah. but they have to have training for the pilots, and right. they have to have a regulatory agency to make sure those pilots are trained well, That's right. and that the planes are safe. Yeah. And so you need to do things like that, mm -hmm. and then. And then finally, the terrorism issue is very real. Right. It's an attractive target because of the uh, fears that people have about radiation. Um, they're not completely balanced, in my opinion, but they exist. Right. Uh, I'm much more scared of having a coal plant spewing <laughs> mercury right. and particulate matter and socks and knots than <laughs> I am about a nuclear power plant. Right. Uh, but, but in any case, you recognize those fears exist and you have to but I'm all for it. Uh, I think Me there's <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing mm -hmm. that says those things. Those are all political and technical yes. issues that can be overcome. Uh, uh, we have uh, less than five minutes, I think, left. Uh, there is one uh, last question I want to ask before we move on. Just uh, Sudan is, is the environment in Sudan is 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 completely different than any uh, other country used uh, nuclear or nuclear power plant. It has different conditions, and how can you expect we gonna uh, bring or export that technology into a country? Well, the first thing I would think about is the cooling of the reactor. The cooling is a problem. Is a yes, problem. The, yeah, you need you need access to water. Right. Even if you <coughs> recycle most of it, you're right. still going to be you know cooling towers. Yeah. Uh, if you cool next to a river, uh, you know there's going to be a thermal load on the river. Again, that's where s the small modular reactors are better because today mm -hmm. the way to make reactors at least quasi-economical is to go to very large reactors, one gigawatt to one and a half gigawatts. Right. That means the cooling is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, gigawatts of electricity power means you've got to have a lot of cooling, which means a lot of rivers or lakes can't take the thermal load. Right. Uh, if you start building in modules of 100 megawatts, you know, 10 times less, then you're in a different space. Mm -hmm. And you can, again, that, but in order to do that, now the mm -hmm. good thing is small mm -hmm. modular reactors can be mass produced in right. a single factory mm -hmm. and shipped around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the bad news is they don't exist as a commercial entity now. Mm -hmm. They they're exist at, in terms of designs and companies that want to go forward with it, but, uh, we just let me let me we'll interrupt this. Okay, okay. Um, they the nuclear reactors. Um, 
in order for a company to go forward, I think they would need maybe 50 orders, pre-orders, mm -hmm. to to actually justify the investment in building a factory that stamps out these reactors. I'm, I don't know whether it's 50 or 20 or 80, right. but it isn't five. <laughs> okay. I see. So, all right, um, because um, we don't have time much left, um, I would like to thank you very much, really, for sure. this time. I, I really enjoyed okay. talking to you. All right, and thank um, you. my pleasure. Yeah, I look forward to have you investing in Sudan sometime. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm not the person <laughs> who has the money to invest, but <laughs> no, if I, I can help you, it's, it's if I can help you, uh, yeah, thank with you. ideas and how to yeah. nurture thank science, you. science education. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, you're welcome. All right.